In this section, we're now going to have a look at the management of the Cortex M4, so coprocessor management. Um, the M4 is classified as a coprocessor because the A7 can enable it and disable it as and when it needs to within an application. So what we're going to have a look through is how we load the firmware in, how we manage the resources and how we manage the shared resources of the MP1 device. So some advantages of having the Cortex M4 or the coprocessor there is it means you can save energy so you can set things and tasks off in the Cortex M4 and potentially power down the A7s and put the DDR into self-refresh to save power in an application. It can address any real-time constraints that you have so if you've got part of your application that has um, deterministic timings then the Cortex M4 can achieve that, whereas the Cortex A7 with the Linux can't exactly get real-time um, results. Potentially, as we highlight, it's a, a coprocessor, so you can just offload work from the A7 to the M4. And it also gives you more direct peripheral control. So with the HAL libraries or the low-layer libraries, you can get more direct control over what a peripheral is actually doing inside. One of the biggest advantages of the Cortex-M4 is it's the same as any other STM32 Cortex-M device. All the code you've written, as long as it's been written using the HAL libraries, can be reused in this Cortex-M4 running on the MP1 device. So, to load the firmware, it's not like a conventional Cortex-M, so it doesn't sit in flash. The M4 firmware is loaded into MCU RAM, and this is done either by the Cortex-A7 or by the U-boot before the Cortex-A7 running the Linux gets up and running. To do this, we have a particular framework called Remote Prop, which is part of the OpenST Linux, and it's part of the main Linux community. So it's a generic section of code called Remote Proc that actually uh, loads the firmware from the A7 or from the Linux environment into the MCU RAM. Depending on what your application is will depend on when you actually do the loading of the firmware. So the earliest you can do it is through the U-boot. So you can actually task U-boot to actually load into the RAM, the, uh, the software. Normally you will get it done by the kernel. And depending on what your application is, you want to manually do it from time to time depending on what you're doing in your application. So, so you've got a bit of flexibility there on when you actually uh, transfer the firmware into the MCU RAM and run the device. The firmware is stored as an L format and it sits inside the Linux file system. So it's under a folder called lib and firmware and we'll have a play with this later on. So you'll see where it sits because we'll generate a .l file and transfer it across to our target board. So the application is running. It'll call the remote proc. That will then load the firmware into the MCU RAM and then the Cortex M4 will either have its clock enabled or disabled by the RCC cell of the device, so the reset clock control cell, as and when it needs to during the application. So it depends on what you are doing. You might not want the Cortex M4 running all the time. Um, you can switch the clock on or off to the Cortex M4 as and when you need to during your application. So resource management. So as we're saying, the M4 is seen as a coprocessor to the A7. We saw earlier on, we will assign the peripherals to either the A7 or the M4, based on what you need to do in your application. Linux does control the clock tree and the power side. So the M4 cannot change the main core frequency of the device. The M4 can control the frequency of the peripherals it's using. So if the timer's got a uh, prescaler, then that can be controlled by the M4. But the main core frequency that's coming in, or sys clock, is controlled by the Linux side. The M4 can do what it needs to do with the peripherals. They are completely independent from the A7. As soon as you assign them to the M4, the A7 can't actually access them anymore. So the device tree blob or the device tree source sets it so that the A7 can't access that particular peripheral. And the OpenST Linux System Resource Manager will automatically reserve the GPIO pins and the specific peripheral clocks for the peripherals of the M4 that you've assigned in the device tree. 
So we've already seen this earlier on. Uh, this is again another snapshot from the Cubamex tool where you can see which peripherals are specifically assigned to the M4 and which peripherals are assigned to the A7 non-secure, which means they're shared and can potentially be used by the Cortex M4. The main device tree, so the main assignment of peripherals, is all done in the TFA section, which is the first stage bootloader. So all the Cubamex tool generates the correct device trees for the correct section, so TFA, U-boot and the kernel. And for the main assignment of the peripherals, this one is done through the TFA side. So when it comes to using a peripheral, there are some um, features that are shared. The GPIOs are shared between the A7 and the M4 because port A might be split across timers, analog pins, things like that. Some might be assigned to the A7, some of those pins might be assigned to the M4. So the whole of the GPIO part is technically shared. As the GPIOs are shared, the external interrupts, which are linked to the physical GPIO pins, they are also shared between the A7 and the A4. To manage the sharing, we have a set of hardware semaphores, so HSEM. This means that you don't have um, the two cores trying to access the same physical bit of hardware at the same time. So you grab hold of the semaphore, do what you need to do on that GPIO port, release the semaphore. The reset and clock control, that is controlled by the A7 side. So it has dedicated registers, so you don't actually have specific semaphores for doing the changing of that. So the MCU has a set of dedicated registers and the MPU has its set of dedicated registers. There's a few other peripherals as well that are shared. So system config, DMA MUX and IPCC. And again, they all require the HSEM as well. So they can um, be activated as and when needed by each of the two cores based on what you're doing in your application. So if we look at these shared resources, so we have the system resource manager on the left hand side, which is um, in the kernel space. And this is using the remote proc community driver. And the system resource manager will reserve the interrupts, the GPIO clocks and the regulators for the Cortex M peripherals based on what is in the device tree. So if you are, you are using, if we look at the block down here, the external interrupts, the GPIOs, the clock, the power, all of that gets reserved on the A7 side. The external interrupts using the hardware semaphores can be configured and changed from the M4 side. So you have direct access to that. The GPIOs can be configured and the drive output can be changed using the M4 side. But the reset and clock control, all you can do is enable and disable the peripheral clocks. So you can't change any of the main system clock trees for that inside there. Any other peripherals, the M4 has 100% control of, no problems at all. If you notice down at the bottom, power, there's no actual um, attempt to control power. Power changes have to be requested. So you have to ask the system to change the power modes from M4 to the A7. So the M4 has to go and ask a standard question or send a standard message to the A7 if it wants to change the power modes. So here's how we do that. If you've got your application on the Cortex M4 running, doing what it needs to do with its normal peripherals, all of a sudden it goes, I need to change my power structure for whatever reason. So it goes to the resource manager asks for the reconfiguration. It then goes through the standard messaging procedure that we have between the two cores. So open amp and the IPCC and a section of memory for the parameters it wants to transfer across. Then on the A side, the IPCC will receive the request. It'll activate its remote proc procedure to receive what the request is based on the message that's been sent. Then the system resource manager will then go and activate the changes and eventually reconfigure the clocks and the regulators for the Cortex M device. So there is a defined procedure for what you need to do if you want to change the power. So you're not fixed, it just has a, a specific procedure so that you can change the uh, power settings.
For the communications, when you want to send large amounts of data across, you'll have your applications running on both sides. So your Cortex-A application and your Cortex-M application. This slide set is showing uh, using the virtual UART. We have a version that's a virtual I2C as well. Virtual UART uses the OpenAMP protocol, which will put all the information into some RAM and bufferings. Once that's been done, the HAL IPCC will trigger all the interrupts to trigger the opposing core to react to the information that's sent across. And then on the other side, you've got RP message, which is the community driver that will receive the information from the buffer and pass that message through what is the equivalent of a UR back into the opposite application on the Cortex A7 side. And it can work in the opposite direction as well. So it's not just fixed in one way, that is. It's a bi-directional channel. We've already seen this before, the engineering boot mode. So when you want to develop the core of your M4 part application, you can do it without the need of the A7, so you can segment it across a team. So someone can be working on the Linux side, somebody else can be working on the Cortex-M side, which is the real-time application side. So as we've said, there's no Linux boot image needed, so you can play around directly with the uh, M4. It's loaded via your JTAG serial with a debug. You just got to remember to address your clocks and alternate functions set up so that your application will run correctly because normally your Linux side would be managing that part of the application. And finally, you've got the debug screen. So when you want to debug your M4, this is a standard um, Eclipse environment that we've been using today. So you've got your step-by-step -step commands or play and resume. You can have a look at the stack to see how many levels of stack you're in. You can view the uh, registers of specific ports and IOs, and then you've got your main code down there. And right at the bottom, you have a console window to see what's going on in the system. So you can actually view the uh, outputs to the Linux host side via a UART. So we're going to have a play with this now in the, the lab. So we'll uh, actually send messages now between the Cortex A7 and the M4, and then we'll send a message from the M4 back to the A7.